each other. My name is Perry Roberts, I am a Wurundjeri elder. Welcome to the land of my father and grandfather and Narangito, who is a man I would like to talk about, is my great, great, great uncle, William Barrick. I acknowledge all my ancestors past and present as well. Thank you. William Barrick, William Barrick and his nephew Robert Wondoon. Robert Wondoon was my great uncle and as our name was back then was Wondoon and when the English came in it was changed to Wondoon. They all lived in Barrack Lane out of Coronado Mission in Hurlville and the mission was established in 1863, closed in 1924. Today that land was given back to us as a Wondoon estate in 1997. Today my uncle lives on there, Alan Wondoon, and we have many, many, many good experiences of camping, fishing and living the old ways as much as we can. William Barrett, uh, with other elders and head man from other clans, would walk two days into Parliament House to talk exactly like this at a forum to see if they can get things better working conditions, health, clothing, medical attention for our own people at Coron Dirk. Coron Dirk established itself as a most econ economically thriving mission station in Australia. William Barrick's growing national and international fame as an artist, singer, storyteller and keeper of our people's culture which was taken away from us. But as you can see today, we are still here. With his charismatic and dignified person, Barrick became an Australian wide leader for civil rights of Aboriginal people. In his latter years, became an international fed celebrity. He died on the 15th of August 1903. And at the moment, there is a monument which is erected at Coron Mission in his honour. Today, Coron is under, like I said, Wondoon State Aboriginal Corporation. Like I said, as my uncle and our family love that place, it's something that's got our hearts there with many other people who were had to leave to go to either Lake Condor, Framingham, or down to Lake Tyres. And my parting words, Woman Jinka, Barangari Wondoon, Yemen Kundi. pleasure to be here at your school tonight for the Ringwood Community Cabinet meeting, the first community cabinet meeting to be held here in the lecture of Deacon. I would especially like to welcome our special visitors here tonight who are up on the stage, the Prime Minister, the Honourable Julia Gillard, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the Honourable Wayne Swan, and all the other members of the Executive who are here tonight, and thank them for their time. I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience, all the people that have registered, and it looks like a few more might have registered than we've got seats, but I'm sure it's going to be good anyway. Since being elected in 2007, I've met regularly with many of the people you see up at the table up here, and always with one thing in mind, and that is always to advocate the case of the constituents of my lecture here in Deakin. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Can I thank Ben and everybody at this great school for making us feel so welcome? Can I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet? And can I thank our school students for a wonderful rendition of the national anthem? I can't sing, so I'm always in awe of people who can, just like Mike. Uh, this is the 40th community cabinet meeting we've had around the country and it is really for you to ask questions and to raise issues that are of concern to you. What a time of remarkable opportunity we have in front of us. Uh, we live in the region of the world that is going to see the most dynamic growth and we can prosper, we can get a lot of opportunity out of that growth in our region by making sure that we're ready to seize everything that can flow in this century of growth and change in our region. We are going to be living on the doorstep of the world's biggest middle class market, uh, the biggest one in human history. And we in Australia can prosper from that. 
uh, selling all of the things that we're good at doing, whether it's manufactured goods, whether it's agriculture, whether it's services, including education and legal services, uh, across the board, we've got big opportunities in the future. But we've got to be in the right position to get those opportunities. That means we've got to make some decisions now and get ready. And the focus of our government has been on making sure we are ready to seize these opportunities in the future. We've come out of the global financial crisis strong, created almost a million jobs, and now we are getting ready for this future of opportunity by investing in our infrastructure, rolling out the national broadband network, getting ready to seize a clean energy future, and most importantly, investing in the skills and capacities of the Australian people, including the huge agenda for changing the way that we fund schools and for improving the quality of schools that we've been outlining in recent days. So the future's never assured, but if we make good decisions now, then we can create a future with opportunity to share and making sure that no one gets left behind and particularly no child gets left behind. I'm very determined that we do create this future, that we're creating a country with a stronger economy, that we are making sure we're a smarter nation by investing in our people and by making sure too that we are a fairer country. We've been investing heavily in our health and aged care systems and now, and I know this is an issue close to the hearts of many here, we want to extend to a better system to support those with disabilities, disability care, because too many Australians have missed out and continue to miss out on the opportunity of a truly decent life in our nation uh, because they have a disability and we aren't supporting them the way we should. So it is a big agenda for change, but some of those issues might be on your mind. You might have some very different issues on your mind. So we'll throw it over to you. Hey, my name is Clinton I'm the Principal Lawyer at the Eastern Community Legal Centre. I just need to apologise that I am a lawyer. We do have a tendency to talk a lot, so I will try to be very succinct. <laughs> I think that's grossly unfair. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, I'd like to congratulate the government um, in relation to your support. <laughs> and recognition of um, family violence and the fact that family violence is a growing issue. It's been massive already, but it's been a continuing growing issue in Australia. And I'd like to you know, congratulate the government in relation to your um, recognition and support of that. Uh, now, there, because I think, because of the uh, support that you've given to family violence, there's more community awareness in relation to this issue, which is great. What that means then is that more people feel that they are able to access the legal system in order to achieve justice in this way. Um, and, and that's a good thing. But what we have noticed at the Eastern Community Legal Centre is that uh, we're, um, people are unable to access free legal services, particularly in the outer eastern region here. And the reason being so, being because there is social isolation, lack of infrastructure, um, you know, the inability to access public transport, to be able to access you know, free legal services like the Eastern Community Legal Centre, which are in the inner east region. So your question is about more resources in that area? Yeah, well, yes. yes okay. All right, thank you very much. I'll, I'll go to the Attorney General. I've had the great advantage of meeting with Belinda before. Uh, she asked a question, and I can say, as I've said, that we have a very detailed submission uh, from the Eastern Community Legal Centre. Uh, the Commonwealth funds 138 community legal centres around the country. Uh, there's never enough funding uh, because we appreciate the incredibly important role that community legal centres play. Uh, the very, very fine work that's done by lawyers and non-lawyers, volunteers in community legal centres. Um, we are going to be looking at the undoubtedly unmet need uh, here in the Outer East of Melbourne. And it was a very useful session that I had with Belinda and her colleagues from the Eastern Community Legal Centre. Um, we will hope that we can continue to have a cooperative relationship with state governments uh, here in Victoria, with the Victorian government, with, which, with whom we jointly fund a number of legal centres and um, uh, it's an ongoing issue. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jerry Bellman. I'm from uh, uh, the member of the historic area. Uh, 
Um, I would like to thank you and Minister McLean and all the rest of your company for the wonderful work. And our people with disabilities, um, with disability care and now your involvement in pushing for the more equal opportunity in um, education and employment by the um, Growing up, I have experienced um, isolation and um, being segregated from my from my years and um, education and employment opportunities have been very limited. Um, so knowing that I I've learned to overcome them and with the help of your forms they a big hand. Um, um, my question is, those reforms are quite expensive and costly. Well, they're worth it, but they, are, they do cost my money. I'm just thinking, for the queer community, would you, if you wanted to break down one more barrier of isolation and um, include more people that you would like to um, rethink your stance on the marriage act and think our neighbours and New Zealand are probably going to vote for it tonight. And we would like to meet in New Zealand. And <laughs> right, thank you. <laughs> won the crowd with the pitch to beat New Zealand. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your uh, comments about disability care, about working for a national disability insurance scheme. It's uh, very important to us, it's very important to the nation and as we uh, lead up to the Council of Australian Governments meeting on Friday, we're working uh, to get more states to say that they will fund their share of the full scheme. So thank you for that. Uh, on uh, same-sex marriage, marriage equality, uh, I doubt we're going to end up agreeing, I'm sorry, but what we have done is, as a uh, political party, uh, we've decided that uh, people can exercise their own views and own conscience when this matter comes before the parliament, which it uh, relatively recently did, and I'm sure it will again in the future. Uh, but you may have put a very persuasive argument for some of getting uh, New Zealand in front. Thank you very much. And I did indicate the gentleman behind. Yes, you, yes, sir. My name is Edmund Bologna. I like to question about work choice. You say many times work choice is dead. But yet, everything. Theory is excellent, but practice is zero. Missing enforce for all court order. I have two court order, Magistrate Court, Superman Court. Seven years are fighting in the, from the system. From the system, from my holiday, my sick, rentancy, everything. Nobody care how practice is working, how long I will wait for more, please. Okay. Well, uh, so thank you for raising that. And that sounds like a very uh, specific example, as you acknowledge. We got rid of work choices and we replaced it with the fair work system, but you've obviously got a particular individual issue. So what I might do is ask uh, one of uh, Bill's staff members to uh, come and get your details. And just as we do that, I'll go to Bill for some quick comments and we'll make sure that that's followed up so we can get your full personal details in a you know, different environment than this. So, Bill. We have a regulator called the Fair Work Ombudsman. They handle a million inquiries a year, a third from small and medium-sized business who just want to find out what the right thing to do, and 600,000 plus inquiries from people who are not sure if they've been, you know, how they should be paid. They investigate matters. Uh, you may or may not have dealt with them, but we'll follow that up. But I'll make two other very quick points. First of all, it's been seven, it is important that in Australia, co competing political parties for government put their views out before an election. The party of work choices, the Liberal Party, it's now been 78 days since the Prime Minister set the date of the election. It isn't good enough 
to just say you want to form a government that not review your plans and your experiences that you got ripped off under the old system, people want to guarantee that that can't happen again. And if you refuse to release your policies, the opposition is, how on earth can you trust that it won't happen again? Thanks, Bill. And we'll get someone to specifically come and get you the details. So, so I'll move over to this block. Here is the lady here, just in the white t-shirt, white jumper. Yeah. 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 Geraldine. Labor Party has been making a difference for the whole of Australia. It's improved Aboriginal health, more money for single pensioners, carers, disability pension, maternity leave, schools, hospitals, etc. Why on earth doesn't the general public know? Now, Labor's um, promotion and publicity is absolutely woeful. Five years, he here. five long years, they have had to build up a relationship with television, newspaper, radio, regional radio, regional newspapers, and they're being paid nothing. Okay. Well, uh, thank, thank you for that observation, I think, more than a question. Obviously, uh, it's uh, our responsibility to be out there explaining our vision for the country's future and the steps that we're taking to achieve it. And thank you for listing off some of the government's achievements. I'm grateful for that. Uh, we've got various ways of getting the message out. Having direct engagements like this, community cabinets, is one of the ways we do it. Uh, we spend a lot of time out in communities talking. Now, of course, with social media, there's ways of getting information around that are different from ways in the past. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, media, whether it's television or radio or newspapers, uh, obviously uh, the people who run those organisations will bring some of their own perspectives to bear on what they think is news and how it should be reported. But let me assure you, uh, we are out and about in the community trying to make the points that really matter for the nation's future. So thank you very much. We'll go to the gentleman at the back. Yes, you, sir. Um, Barry, uh, Minister from the Disability Action Group is to wait. Excuse me for not standing up. Duncan needs to know why three of your ministers have refused to come to address with disability trust. Why is it a stipulation? to work no more than seven hours a week when the normal working day is eight hours. Please, would you answer this? Will the NDIS ever get up and running with the high debt the country is in? Okay, thank and you, sir. Oh, sorry. One more thing. One more. You dipped me out and said you before. Sorry. I was crossing the list to come and see you before. Uh, to see me? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, look, we'll, we can follow up with you. What I'll do now is I'll get uh, Jenny Macklin uh, as the Minister to answer your direct questions. Okay. We, we do do the best we can to see people beforehand. Obviously, the demand is always uh, bigger than the available time. But we'll get Jenny to answer your question now. Thanks very much, PM. And I'll get one of my staff to come and get your details so that we can uh, communicate with each other. But just on your general question about uh, uh, whether or not the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which we call Disability Care Australia, is going to happen, it certainly is. Uh, the, the Treasurer put uh, $1 billion into the National Disability Insurance Scheme in last year's budget so that it can start from the 1st of July. It's going to start in Geelong and in the Hunter in New South Wales, for children in South Australia and for adolescents in Tasmania. And all of that will start from the 1st of July. We've got staff being recruited, the legislation is through the parliament, the money is in the budget. Uh, I was in Geelong last week, I can assure you people with disability 
uh, getting ready, the staff are getting ready. It's all about to uh, be very real for people in Geelong and in the Hunter, South Australia and Tassie. As the Prime Minister indicated a minute ago, uh, we're negotiating with uh, the states to uh, get the full scheme rollout. We've agreed it with New South Wales so far, and we're very hopeful that we'll have other states uh, agree in the very near future. Okay, thank you. One of my staff's just behind you, and he'll get your details now. Okay, can, can we just get you to follow up with the staff member here, because we've got a lot of people wanting to ask questions I want to get through them. So I'll take the young lady there, yes, you. Hall. I'm involved with the group Baby Boomers for Climate Change Action, which my mother started. I'm also the founder of Move Green, which is a youth and environmental and climate change organisation based in Central Asia. I had the pleasure earlier of coming into Tanya in the toilet and she said that <laughs> we were both washing our hands. <laughs> and she said, the Prime Minister, that you are on a political knife edge, and I'm afraid that that is true. Fortunately, your biggest political opponent happens to be Donald Duck. <laughs> and you also have the biggest issue facing mankind at your fingertips. Climate change is the biggest issue facing Australia. It will affect our economy, it will affect our health, and it will affect the stability of our region. Australians care about climate change, and Mr Simon Deacon cares about climate change. Maybe you can't hear this in offices that are sound padded by the influence of vested interests, but the community cares about climate change. So my question is, why aren't you making climate change the issue for this election? Because this will affect my generation. Well, uh, number one, I'm going to say you never know where you're going to find a cabinet minister, do you? Uh, those cabinet ministers get around. Uh, no, number two, uh, I can assure you that from the point of view of the government, uh, climate change and combating it in the most effective way, putting a price on carbon, uh, that will be one of the big issues uh, as we move to election day. It's certainly been uh, probably the single most debated issue during this period of parliament. Uh, and we took that big step knowing that it would be controversial, but we took that big step because it's absolutely right for our nation's future to put a price on carbon, to start getting carbon out of our economy and to make a difference to the amount of carbon pollution in our atmosphere. It's right for our economy to send a signal that we want a clean energy future. But it's also right for all of the generations to come. So uh, I, when you said baby boomer, so you're certainly not one, uh, but uh, you're, you're amongst the generations that are going to inherit this planet. Uh, and we want to make sure that we, this generation, has done everything we can uh, to combat climate change. It's a sharp distinction between the political parties and clearly going to be a very big debate in the lead up to the September election. So thank you for your question. I'll take the lady here. Yes, I'd just like to congratulate you very much, commend you for establishing the Royal Commission into Child Abuse in Religious Institutions. But my question is... is what now happens to the parliamentary inquiries for victims who don't fall under the umbrella of what happens um, with the World Commission but still have um, heinous damage done to them through other forms of abuse? Okay. Now look, we did uh, think very uh, strongly when we set up the Royal Commission about what was the right way of doing the terms of reference and who should serve as Royal Commissioners and it was uh, you know, a balance between making sure that we uh, not only gave uh, people who had survived child sexual abuse the ability to have their stories heard and to finally say to them, you know, we're listening, you know, there's not a closed door in front of you anymore. Uh, and, you know, to get, get to the bottom of the lessons we could learn for our nation's future. Uh, we knew what we were setting up was big and it was going to take a lot of time and then it becomes a judgment call about, you know, how big and consequently how much time is taken. But there are some other uh, processes that are in train and uh, is Mark, are you able to uh, make a comment about that? 
Uh, just in relation to your specific inquiry, this is a very large inquiry, it's a national inquiry, and of course, as you said in your question, there are other state inquiries that are proceeding. The Commission is very concerned not to duplicate the work, but it is going to refer to and make reference to use the work that's done in those other inquiries, uh, which include particularly the Victorian inquiry um, into the handling of child abuse by religious and other organisations. It's due to report in September 2013. The Royal Commission is a, a larger exercise, but very much it's going to refer to and use to the extent that it can work done by other inquiries, not just this current one in Victoria, but a whole range of other inquiries that have taken place in the past. As the Prime Minister said, it's a very large exercise, but it is now underway. The Royal Commission has held its first hearing here in Melbourne on the 3rd of April. And in the terms of reference, we did refer to uh, child sexual abuse and related matters because we're aware that uh, a number of people who suffered child sexual abuse also suffered other forms of abuse that needs to be exposed and uh, that we need as a nation to let people tell their stories. Uh, we all need to, you know, as painful as it is, we all need to face up to what has occurred. Uh, and to, to learn the lessons for the future. So thank you for your question. Now, my name is Jim Beggs, and on behalf of my wife and I, I'd like to congratulate the Labor government since it's been in office for the unprecedented support that you've given to net pensioners like us. <laughs> it's a question or a challenge to you, Julia, <laughs> that um, I've spent 60 years working in industry where 45 D visas has affected my industry. And the opposition have tried to make this a class war issue. And in my opinion, it's not a class war issue. We are a multicultural nation. We are in favour of people coming and living with us. It's a question of fairness. And I hope you take on Abbott and his question of unfairness. Thank you very much. much and I can uh, assure you we're going to uh, do everything we can to keep arguing the cause of fairness and I think that that is a good word to use. We are a wonderful multicultural country. Uh, we've been uh, very much strengthened and enhanced by migration. I'm a migrant myself, I know that from my own personal experience. Uh, but clearly there is a jobs and employment issue uh, about the use of uh, temporary overseas workers when there are qualified Australians who are looking for that work and we want to make sure uh, that we're always running the system so that Australians who are there with the qualifications get the opportunities and that we never uh, use the fact that we can get people on temporary visas from overseas as an excuse for not properly investing in our skills and training system and making sure that we've got people there for the future. So thank you very much for that question. Good evening, I'm Joan Gabriel. And it's really good to know that your government is going to be uh, is going to be helping make sure that no one is going to be left out. My question is, for those people, for those young people who are at the risk of going into nursing homes and residential aged care, what provision is being provided for them to ensure that that doesn't happen? Uh, we just had a great conversation about this, uh, both uh, Jenny and I, uh, and uh, I'll, because this relates to the design of disability care, of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, what I'll do is I'll turn to Jenny to describe how we want the system to work for the future, because we do know, uh, and we had the opportunity to have a very personal conversation about this, uh, we do know that there are too many young people uh, with uh, profound disabilities and the only option they've got at the moment is residential aged care uh, and that that is not meeting their needs. So thank you for your question and I'll turn to Jim. Thanks Pam. Uh, what will happen in the future, unlike now, is that people will uh, get the opportunity to say what it is that they want. What is it uh, that you as a person with a disability want uh, to have as your place where you will live What's the sort of support that you need? Uh, all of these issues will be worked through with 
with uh, Disability Care Australia. So rather than being told, as so many uh, young people are, that uh, the only, ch only opportunity they have for care is in a nursing home, in so many cases totally inappropriate, uh, we want to make sure that uh, there are a whole range of choices available to people that suit their individual needs uh, and that's really one of the great hopes of the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, my name's Alice Walter. Yeah, I have a 11-year-old child and he has autism. Oh, autism, yes. Yeah, he attends a state school and he gets no support, no funding. And the thing is, he, he doesn't know his alphabet, he doesn't know his tables. He only reads his grade two level and he's a grade six student. Is there anybody up there who can help? Thank you. Thanks for your uh, question. What I'm going to do is ask Jacinta Collins. Uh, you would be aware that we're in the midst of a, a big debate uh, about improving the resourcing of our schools, making sure that our schools uh, properly resource the teachers, the classrooms, the kids for generations to come. Uh, it's a big debate. We're very determined to win it. And within that big debate, Jacinta has been personally leading the government's work on what we can do better for students with disabilities, uh, including uh, autism and uh, other uh, conditions which relate to and affect a child's learning just as they affected your child's learning. Uh, so I'll turn to Jacinta on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. And please, I'd like to talk to you further about the details of your particular circumstances. It's it's a very sad story you hear about children whose education needs aren't being met within our schools, which partly drives our determination to, to change that situation. Now, um, Minister Macklin might want to say some more about our particular autism package where we're working with families around how to better support students with autism. But regarding schools, uh, this is why we are picking up the uh, Gonski Review recommendations about establishing a national plan for students with disability. You would be aware, or many people are aware, that there are disparities across the country in how students with disability are supported, whether it's in mainstream schools or whether it's in special schools, such as the Ashwood Special School I visited today, whether it's in government schools or non-government schools. It's a real hodgepodge, and we as a nation need to address those problems. There are some immediate measures that the Commonwealth Government has introduced to, to uh, make a down payment on the reforms that we're planning for. But our objective is, is to pick up the recommendation under the Gonski Review of a loading to be applied for students with disability in schools and for that loading to be used by the school to meet the needs of individual students and the level of adjustment they need to uh, maximise their potential in their learning environment. Uh, my name is Doug Pollard, I'm a 63 year old gay man and I'm very interested in what you're doing with aged care reform. Uh, I have however been rather disturbed to discover that the religious exemptions that allow uh, religious run institutions to discriminate against people like me um, are not going to be removed in your Sex Discrimination Act. Will you as Prime Minister give a guarantee that you'll get this sorted before the next election and get those religious exemptions out of the way? I have asked your Attorney General about this, but he couldn't give me an answer. Right. Oh, well, I actually think he's got a great deal of uh, expertise on this, so uh, I, will, uh, I will turn to the Attorney-General. We're very aware of the issue that you raised, so Mark. Thanks very much, Prime Minister. The, uh, as the questioner would certainly know, uh, we introduced um, a bill to the Parliament in the very last sitting week which is going to add a ground of discrimination to our, our package of anti-discrimination laws, a ground of discrimination based on sexual orientation, gender identity and intersex status. It was part of that additional ground, a much larger consolidation bill, which was a project um, that was consulted on through November, December and into February this year and reported on by 
by Senate Committee. The consolidation project put together the five acts of parliament that together make up the body of anti-discrimination law in Australia. They've been legislated over four decades. And one part, this is what the question was about, was to cut back the exemption that presently exists for religious institutions and it cut it back in the area of aged care services. Um, it's something that I've taken only forward at the moment out of that big package, the additional ground of discrimination for which there is absolutely clear support across all parties for that to go forward. And I've asked the department to look again at the much larger consolidation project of which this removal of the exemption for religious institutions running aged care services was part. Um, we are still considering what further may be able to be done. But you could take heart from the fact that there was, in that consultation process and in the Senate committee report, very little criticism of the removal of that exemption insofar as there's an exemption for aged care services. So it's still under consideration. I want to have a talk to you later. And uh, just Tanya wants to say something briefly too. I was just going to very quickly add uh, that my colleague Mark Butler, who's the Minister for uh, Ageing, um, had some funding uh, specifically set aside that he has uh, um, used for training for aged care workers to make sure that when they have gay or lesbian uh, uh, residents in their aged care facilities that they're treated properly with respect. Right, Minister uh, Michael Phillips, Principal of Ringwood Secondary College, and uh, I'm interested in uh, getting your views around uh, some of the Gonski uh, reform issues. Uh, I'm sure once we get through the argy barge of uh, you know, the state negotiations that uh, the, the ability to increase life chances for every young Australian is going to be improved immensely. Uh, in, in my school alone, without any of the add-ons, uh, it's over $2 million in extra recurrent funding every year. And uh, what I was wondering is that how can we ensure that the funding actually reaches uh, the schools and is not actually creamed up by the local education authority? <laughs> You're getting a round of applause from the treasurer. It's not often that happens at community cabinet, so uh, he's at fun with you on this agenda. Uh, the the uh, debate now, I mean, we have over five long years worked out a new system of school funding. When I say five years, it's taken us uh, five years to show school by school what's being achieved in schools, five years to show the resources available in the school. When we came to government, no one could tell you uh, how schools were going, where the most disadvantaged schools were. That information just didn't exist. Uh, so we put it all together and then we've showed uh, by working in a targeted series of schools what can be achieved when you put in new resources and you combine that with some new ways of working you can really lift the standards for the kids. Uh, now we want to do that in every school around the country or 9,500 of them get it right for the future. Uh, stop the sort of uh, you know politics that can happen between school systems, get it right for every school. So that's a school resource standard with loadings for things like disadvantage, which we know uh, make a difference to children's education and means that you need more resources to teach them. Uh, the, the debate now isn't, isn't with us because we're so determined to get this done. It's to make sure that we get states and territories signing on. We're so determined to get it done, we're prepared to put in $2 for every one that they put in. And I can be very clear uh, that we uh, are going to make sure that money uh, passes uh, through uh, state governments and gets into schools. We won't uh, be uh, signing up agreements that allow state government bureaucracies to keep money uh, in, you know, sort of record amounts or anything like that. Uh, we'll be making sure that there are proper arrangements so state education departments have the resources they need but that they are not keeping money that should have gone to schools. Uh, we'll also be making sure that it's not we're tipping money in and state governments are taking money out, that uh, there are no more cuts. And you know, you uh, and the people in this audience tonight 
probably would all know the impact of liberal cutbacks on education in this state and in technical and further education. So thank you for your question and we've got a lot of work to do. We're just going to take a couple of last questions. I'm sorry we are really running out of time but I did I promise the lady here and I know just yes, you, you in the front row. Yes, yes absolutely. Yeah, Heather. My name is Heather Lawson, I'm deaf blind and I work for the Deaf Blind Advocacy Group in Victoria. My question is um, just I'm wondering if you're aware that um, the TAFE course for Auslan here in Victoria has been closed and that happened last year. It's quite disappointing and quite frustrating for us and um, it's just because around Australia we don't have enough education and qualifications around Auslan qualifications. Um, they've been um, also if we don't have the education and qualifications around Auslan, that means we have a lack of resources in terms of Auslan interpreters and one-to-one -one support workers. And that comes back to the RMIT TAFE course in regards to the interpreting as well. So that that's alarming for us, the deafblind community. Uh, in regards to our future and what will happen to our support. So I'd like to know what, what you think will happen for our future. Now I am aware of this issue. Um, and thank you very much. We had uh, a great meeting beforehand and a great exchange and thank you uh, for coming to meet with me and Jenny and for giving us an insight into your world and the services and supports you need. It was a really unique opportunity for us. Uh, I am aware that there has been this cutback. We talk more broadly then about TAFE cutbacks and some of the things that have happened. Uh, and I know that there is some work happening on this. And uh, Jenny, you might be in a position to refer to some of the things we're uh, trying to see the Victorian state government do in this area. Well, if I could just uh, reiterate how important this course is. Uh, for those of you who can't see uh, the interpreting going on down the front here, uh, there are an amazing group of uh, interpreters uh, providing um, a very, very skilled, uh, I really mean this, I that they're all looking shy up the front here now while I say this. <laughs> Uh, to everybody who's still got a question, we do try and find ways of following up. Uh, thank you for coming along this evening. Thank you for the spirit in which people have participated. Just in finishing, thank you, Prime Minister, for coming to our electorate to show your support for the community here in Deakin. Thank you to all the Cabinet Ministers and all the other Ministers and Parliamentary Secretaries that we have up here on the table for your time and your interest in the issues raised in our community. You've been generous with your, with your time. It's uh, most appreciated. Of course, there are people that have further questions and between my office and uh, the people that are organising the event here, hopefully we are able to accommodate all those uh, at a later date. I'd especially like to thank everyone who's here tonight. For those of you who haven't got a seat and have stood patiently at the back, and those of you that have got a seat, thank you for your interest in the process of government. It's always heartening as a local member to see how many people care about the decisions that government makes and are prepared to have input into that. And I'd like to say that is our night. This Ringwood Community Government has been very successful.